Hey everybody, how are you? This is uh, Dr. Jeffrey Wise talking to you from the Wise Center for Plastic Surgery in Wayne, New Jersey. I hope everyone is staying safe and uh, staying sane during these uh, challenging times. I just wanted to talk today a little bit about um, hair loss and what we can do about it. I've had a ton of questions on social media and uh, people calling into the office in the last several weeks asking questions about hair loss, possible treatments, and uh, so on. So. The first question is, you know, who, who is affected by hair loss? And the answer is um, a lot of people. Essentially, hair loss affects approximately half of all men by the age of 50 years old, some men as early as their teen years. It's largely genetic, although there are other factors that contribute to hair loss, but the most common factor by far is something called androgenic alopecia, which is hair loss of a genetic variety. As far as women, uh, female uh, hair loss, the statistics are a little bit different. Usually it affects about less than 10% of women before the age of 50. After the age of 50 to 70 years old, it could affect up to 40% of women. So very, very common in women too. A group that's often overlooked by hair loss treatments, but we, we pride ourselves here on taking care of female hair loss as well. Let's talk a little bit about male pattern baldness or androgenic alopecia. So as I said before, some men start losing their hair as early as their teen years. This is called the Norwood scale. And it's a very, very common scale that we use to assess hair loss. It goes up to one through seven. Uh, one is essentially normal juvenile hair. This is the hair that, that people talk about. They say, well, gee, you know, you should have seen my hair when I was 14 years old. It's uh, a Norwood one. As we get into our adult years, into our 20s and 30s, it's perfectly normal to have what we call Norwood two level hair. And that's basically just a slight recession of the uh, hairline in the frontal area, a little bit of what we call temporal recession. Some people call them the alleys or the power alleys. Very, very common and considered actually normal as men get into their 20s and uh, 30s. We move into Norwood class three, four, five, six, and seven, and you can just see a, a, a progression of recession of the frontal hairline. In addition, oftentimes men will also have some thinning in the crown. We call this like a a war on two fronts. As it progresses, it does potentially lead to what we consider complete baldness, and that's in the uh, Norwood six and seven range. So the question really is, you know, when people come to me and they say, you know, I'm X years old and this is what I have now, and I, you know, what can I do about it? It's really good to look at hair loss in like a stepwise ladder type of formation. And we, we say that based on non-surgical therapies, elevating to, to more invasive surgical therapies. So non-surgical stuff, especially for men, you're looking at uh, something like a DHT blocker uh, that's called finasteride or uh, brand name is called Propecia. Propecia blocks the enzyme that breaks down hair and we call that a DHT blocker. Propecia is an extremely effective drug. The, uh, the data in large studies is very, very compelling. Men who take this pill once a day tend to show a reduction in hair loss in about 90% of men. And in 70% of men, they actually report some regrowth of their hair taking uh, finasteride or Propecia. Uh, downsides of it, you're somewhat married to it. As soon as you stop taking it, within several months, uh, you actually go back to your hair as if you had never taken it. So it's something that you really have to commit to. In addition to that, uh, there are uh, some men that have experienced some sexual side effects from Propecia. That varies depending on the studies that, that you read, but we usually quote patients at anywhere between two and 5%. And that includes anywhere from a decrease in sexual libido or, or sex drive to even uh, potentially even as extreme as erectile dysfunction, although that's uh, extremely uncommon. Another common medicine that, that's used to treat hair loss is Rogaine or Minoxidil. Minoxidil is a uh, vasodilator. It was originally designed as a antihypertensive or anti-blood pressure medicine. That medicine is applied topically to the head. We also uh, do prescribe this sometimes as a pill that could also be uh, taken, and that's by prescription. Topical minoxidil can be purchased over the counter at any grocery store, uh, Costco, etc. And what that does is by applying it once or twice a day to the scalp, it brings more blood flow to the area, and there are other factors th that uh, help hair loss that are less well understood. It does actually help regrow hair and hold on to your hair as well. But once again, uh, minoxidil like finasteride requires a bit of a commitment in the sense that if once you stop taking it, you do lose some of the effects that uh, you might have with the uh, drug. Also, some people experience some sensitivity to the uh, medication, a little redness of the scalp, etc. If that happens to you, you know you can make a decision about whether or not to uh, take it. Obviously, uh, vitamin supplementation is very, very important for uh, hair growth. So we talk about some of the essential vitamins that uh, promote hair growth. Specifically, we talk about biotin. We talk about formulations such as Viviscal and Nutrafol. These are all products that we offer here at the Y Center. 
Finally, there's also something called low-level light therapy. That therapy, these are called like the laser caps. There's a ton of products out there. You have to be somewhat careful about choosing the right one for you. Not all of them are FDA approved, and some of them have uh, less efficacy than others. Basically, the theory is that the certain wavelengths of light promote cells in the hair to uh, grow, and it's been demonstrated to help people in uh, select cases. So that's another option that you have. Typically with laser cap therapies, you would use the cap potentially something like three or four times a week and sessions of approximately a half an hour. So now let's get into stem cell therapies or or we consider PRP. So there's two broad forms of stem cell therapy that we offer here at, at our center. One is PRP or platelet-rich plasma. The other is something called exosomes, which is a bit newer. PRP is something that we've been doing at, at the office for many years now. It essentially involves drawing a little bit of blood from a peripheral vein. We spin it down in a special system called the arteriocyte or Magellan uh, system. That creates a slurry of platelets. Those platelets are then combined and injected into the scalp. It almost acts as uh, a fertilizer for the head. It promotes cells to come out of what we call the resting phase and go into the antigen or, or uh, growth phase. So we've, we've had a lot of really, really great success with that. Typically with PRP treatments, it's done as an outpatient procedure. You can go right home. And we do three treatments, approximately one month apart, and then maintenance therapy approximately every six to 12 months. And that only involves uh, one treatment every six to 12 months. PRP works best when combined with some of the other therapies that we were talking about, such as medication or laser cap therapy or even uh, surgical transplants. Exosomes are essentially small subcellular, so not the actual cells themselves, but components of cells from healthy bone marrow donors that are carefully tested, obviously, and injected in, into the scalp. We find that the percentage or concentration of, of growth factors in these cells is very, very high. And therefore, for small areas of uh, hair loss or more focused areas, it's extremely effective. Exosomes typically requires one treatment, and the uh, treatments have been demonstrated to last at least six to 12 months and possibly longer. So we've really been enjoying that as a, as a therapy. Finally, let's, let's get into hair transplant. Hair transplantation is essentially grafting hair from the back of the head, where the hair essentially never falls out, to the front of the head. It's come a long way in the last several decades. I'm sure everyone has this image when they think of hair transplants is people with like plugs. In the old days, they used to take many, many hairs at one time, and these are called macro grafts, and they used to put these grafts in, and with 12 or 13 hairs at a time, you'd have almost like a doll's look, and it would look very, very unnatural. Nowadays, uh, that's not the case at all. We do micrographs, or what we call follicular unit extractions, where we essentially take just the follicular units, the holes that come out of your head. Sometimes there's one hair that comes out, two, three, sometimes four. We take those specific follicular units, and we implant them onto the scalp. So at the most, you would have one or two or three hairs transplanted at one time, which is the way it occurs in nature. So it's really almost impossible uh, to tell if someone's had transplants. Also, let's talk a little bit about the difference between follicular unit extraction and the traditional ellipse incision. There's basically two ways to, to get the hair out of the back of the head. The first is making a small incision in the back of the head. We take out a strip of scalp, and then we process the hairs on the back table and implant those in, into the scalp. That's the, the strip technique. What we've seen more of lately, and what we do more, and what we're kind of known for here, is something called follicular unit extraction. Follicular unit extraction is when we actually take the hairs out individually from the back, and it's a series of thousands of tiny little holes. The punch that we use is very, very small. It's about seven tenths of one millimeter. So what ends up happening is we take the grafts out from a, a, a large area in the back of the head, and then over several days, uh, the hair just grows around it and you can't see anything. The downside of the strip technique when you make the incision is that if you cut the hair really, really short, you might be able to see some outline of, of, of the scar. And we've all seen people at public places, people we may know, people at the airport, etc., that have this incision in the back of their head and people are like, oh my God, it looks like they had like brain surgery or something. And in reality, they really just had a hair transplant. The nice thing about the follicular unit extraction technique is that the tiny little dots are extremely well hidden. So this allows people, or gives them the flexibility to wear their hair really however they like. So they can wear their hair very, very short, almost a buzz cut, and you really can't see any evidence in the back of the head that they've had a hair transplant. The results from the recipient site on the top of the head from a FUE and or strip technique are essentially the same. But the grafting technique, uh, at least in 2020, 
and in recent years, uh, it's much more and more common in our practice to do the FUE technique where there's no incision. As far as, you know, how, how does a, uh, a transplant work? Uh, you know, how do you, how do you determine how many grafts you need and so on? Uh, just a quick rule of thumb. This is a compact disc or, or a DVD. To fill this entire area with hair depends on the person and the thickness of, of each hair shaft. But in any given individual, it might take anywhere from, let's say, 2,200 to 2,500 grafts to fill this area. So that's kind of a, a rough idea of how many grafts that you might need. Obviously, a lot of people don't actually have a CD placed on their head, but you, you would cut it up into sections and stuff like that, and uh, this just gives you a rough idea of how many transplants that you might require for your case. That's something that obviously, with a lot of experience, you know, I, I could uh, help you during a consultation and we could figure out the best number of grafts that we could safely do uh, together. As far as the, the day, how, how the actual procedure goes, we bring in in the morning, we actually give you a haircut. Typically that involves uh, shaving the back of the head. As I said before, that hair grows back very, very quickly. Usually by a week you can't see anything, but we shave the hair at least in the very back. Oftentimes we'll, we'll trim the hair on the top as well. The first part of the morning, we take hairs out of the back of the head with the FUE procedure. We do little nerve blocks, so people are always concerned, obviously, about pain, discomfort, etc. I can tell you that we do uh, nerve blocks as a head and neck surgeon. Um, you know, we're, we're very skilled at that, and so it's a couple little pinches, and then your whole head is really numb. So it's really quite easy. We also give you some drugs, some uh, oral drugs that kind of take the edge off and make the experience a little bit more pleasant for everybody. Once the morning is done, we put you over, uh, we flip you over on your back so you're sitting in a chair very, very normally, and at that point we place the grafts in their recipient sites. The whole process, depending on number of grafts, could take anywhere from four to, to eight or ten hours, but once again, it really just depends on the case that you might require. Typically, we order lunch for every patient. It's a nice day, and every room that we have in the office here has televisions, you can watch TV, if you need to get up and go to the bathroom, you're not like locked in or anything, you can use the restroom, stuff like that. So results from a transplant. People always ask me, you know, I'm getting married in a month, you know, is it gonna make a difference? But in one month, am I gonna see all my hair grow in? And the answer uh, is that typically, hair really starts to grow in at about three to four months on the earlier side, but typically we see really, really nice results in the front of the head, in this area, usually within about six months. The final result, including the front and, and the back, is a little bit over a year. So we'll typically see patients at six months, and we'll also see them at a year and track their uh, progress. Pain after a transplant is usually very, very mild. People report some soreness in the back of the head, a little bit on top, but usually could be alleviated with just uh, maybe Tylenol, although we do supply stronger pain medicine in the short term in case people need it. Frequently when we perform hair transplant procedures, we provide PRP at the same time. We think that PRP is a nice way to enhance the uh, graft take, shorten recovery. We think it mitigates shock from hair falling out. So we think it's a really great treatment. So I would say that we perform PRP treatments at the same time as transplants in probably at least 90% of our cases. People often ask me, you know, hey, I've had a few transplants in the past. I'm not sure how much hair I really have in the back, how much donor I have left. And that's something that's kind of unique to our practice. We actually do body hair transplantation. So there's no doubt that the scalp definitely provides the best match but frequently we'll actually uh, take hair from underneath the uh, chin area and transplant it back to the top of the head. We've done uh, chest hair before as well to transplant to the top of the head, not as a uh, first time uh, transplanting medium, but we actually use it typically when people have exhausted some of their transplants in the back, we can take it from other places to give them the result that they're looking for. Oftentimes people will ask me, it's very, very common now, beards seem to be very in. Uh, oftentimes guys, have beards that aren't quite as full as they'd like to have them. So it's very, very common now in our practice that we'll do beard transplants, where we actually either give people beards who aren't able to grow them, or fill in beards that are a little bit patchy and they want to have more of a fuller look. So very, very common. The other thing that we often get asked about are eyebrow transplants. So people say, you know, gee, you know, my eyebrows are really thin. Uh, maybe I over manicured them when I was younger or, or what have you. We oftentimes will use uh, back of the head uh, scalp hair to actually transplant to the eyebrows, which is an incredibly gratifying and really cool procedure. So we really enjoy that also. So there's really a lot of uh, advancements and uh, cutting edge stuff that uh, we're able to provide for patients here. And uh, the only way to really find out is obviously to just give us a call and I'd be happy to discuss your particular case with you.